Look at all those beautiful colors. W1VLF. Hey everybody, my name is Paul, W1VLF, and welcome back to the lab. In the last video we talked about a little bit about SDRs, but mostly about the high pass filter to eliminate overload, noise, spurious emissions, and things that would get into or be generated by the front end of some of the some of the SDRs that are out there. That's just one thing you need to uh, look out for. Uh, a, t a popular topic nowadays is e-probe antennas. There's they're they're everywhere. You go on eBay, you you'll find. Um, Ten different manufacturers of e-probe antennas, and they're kind of, they're very interesting, especially for me with my call sign W1VLF. I have an interest in listening to signals below the 500 kilohertz band. Um, so one of the things you do is you remote your antenna. Um, I'll show you a little clip of of my e-probe out in the woods. So you remote your antenna; it's 350 feet out in the woods, but you still have a problem. You're away from all the noise in the house but you still have a problem and that is the noise that's conducted onto the transmission line getting out to your antenna. So that's where this little baby comes in handy right here, common mode choke. This is going to put, essentially put a resistance in series with the outside of the coax, not the inside. There's no loss or it's minimal in tenths of a dB, but any noise that's generated in the house and wants to propagate out to your antenna is going to be reduced by this and I'll give you a little better look at what's inside of it how it's made some slides on um, that are going to show as I go through the live demonstration after each step of the way because you need one here in the house and you need another one out at the antenna especially if you're running an e-probe antenna let me uh, zoom in take a quick look at what's inside this guy and then I'll um, do voiceover on some slides, give you a kind of an explanation, and then we'll go to uh, the live video. And by the way, I'm trying something new tonight. There's a product called Cam Studio I bought. Um, my daughter-in-law recommended it. My son and daughter-in-law recommended it. And so instead of having to aim the camera and point to things on the screen with um, a pencil, I'm going to be able to do that live. So this will be the first time that happens. Anyway, let's take a closer look at this choke, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go through the slides and, and get rolling. Let me set up, and I'll be back. Okay, we're back here at the Group W bench. Uh, I'm going to take the cover off this to give you a little better look at it here. I took some higher resolution pictures. I'll put those up on the screen after. Then you can pause and take a look at them if you want to try to get a better idea of how it's how it's made inside. But I can, I'll let you know something right now. It's, uh, it's not very complex. Uh, I use a plastic box because both of the BNC connectors are mounted to the plastic. When you build one of these common mode chokes, you can't have the two BNCs grounded to each other or connected. They have to be on either uh, isolated or be the type that are, are um, not grounded. And the reason for that is you want that inductance inside to be in series with the shield, not with the inside, not with the uh, center conductor. Whoop, a little bit more on that one here. All right. So... And, you know, this is, this is, this is, everything's backwards when you're doing this on the screen. So, all right, so I have four cores in here. I don't know if you can see it or not, but this is some really small, I think this is 174 coax. But essentially what you have is four cores and another four cores connected together uh, to form sort of a binocular type core arrangement. And the reason I do that is so that I can get an incredible amount of inductance just on the outside of the cable, not on the inside. So the loss through this thing is maybe a half or a quarter of a dB, but the loss for any noise that's traveling on this cable 
it sees this as a very high impedance, a reactance, and can't propagate out through to the uh, to the antenna. So I'm um, going to put up those pictures now. And uh, let you uh, take a closer look at these, and then I'll uh, do I'll um, sort of do a play by play uh, of what's going to happen later on in the video. I'll be back. So here's a close up shot of the plastic container. I think I bought these on eBay for a few bucks a piece. Um, the only important thing here to note is that this is a plastic container, and that the two BNC ground connections are isolated from each other allowing that choke inside the box to be in series. Uh, this one, uh, the active area of this, <laughs> active area, the area inside this box is something like uh, four inches by about two and a half inches. Another quick close-up showing the cores in the uh, isolated BNC's and an even tighter shot of the the cores. Um, these cores, I don't really know what the material is on them, but when tested, they provide an, a lot of inductance. Uh, I'm not really too concerned about this um, common mode choke at frequencies much above a, a couple of megahertz, so I wound it basically just for maximum inductance, and I'm not too worried about any weird resonances that show up because of the capacitance between windings. This slide shows that there is uh, almost no loss through the common mode choke. And very quickly, this slide shows just uh, the amount of attenuation that's in between the shields, not the center conductor, not the through loss through the actual coax, but on the shields of the uh, BNCs. This is what's going to oppose the noise from getting on the coax and traveling its way out to the antenna. A little diagram here showing the configuration of the SDR, the power inserter, and the active antenna. Um, yeah, the SDR, obviously, pretty self-explanatory. The power inserter is where the DC voltage is injected, and that powers the active antenna. As you can see, there is just noise everywhere impinging upon the SDR, the ground cables in the house, the power inserter, the long length of coax to the active antenna. All these are trying to make their way out to the active antenna and then of course impress themselves on that high impedance whip. So we need to make sure that we put a stop to this or mitigate it to the best of our ability. In this diagram we've added the first uh, common mode choke right after the power inserter that keeps a lot of the noise from the house from getting onto the coax cable. And finally the last common mode choke just before the antenna which if there's any noise picked up by the coax prevents it from getting to the antenna itself. And um, in the demonstrations you'll see as I add each choke in uh, you'll see the difference in signal amplitudes and the noise. Hey everybody we're out in the woods again just wanted to give you a quick look at the active antenna that we're going to be talking about uh, in part. Um, also, get a little bit closer look. This is one of the common mode chokes. Not really sure how good this is going to show up, but uh, this is one of the common mode chokes that we're, is going to be the main topic of discussion. And the active antenna is in this little Chinese Hammond box knockoff and uh, just a little whip antenna uh, you probably really can't see that I'll pull it down I don't know three feet three feet tall that's all it is and uh, I'm gonna link to a schematic for this as well so uh, in my case here it's BNC output here is uh, one of the common mode chokes that I have. There's going to be two of them in the system and I'll show you what happens when you take each one of them out. Hey everybody, it's Paul W1VLF and now we're over at the ham shack looking at the uh, visual display here. 
The radio is a AirSpy HF Plus. Software is console version 3. And there is an awful lot of pretty colors there, as I had mentioned earlier. Um, so what are we seeing here? Um, if, you, if you look way over to the right here at 60 kilohertz, left-hand side starts at 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 kilohertz, all the way up to 60 kilohertz, you can see a carrier popping in and out of the, of the noise there. And that carrier is WWVB in Boulder, Colorado. The antenna system is the uh, active whip that I showed before. It's about 350 feet out in the woods. And even moving, removing the antenna that far away, there are still signals that are conducted on the feed line that go from the shack here out to that antenna. You know, we're dealing with very, very low frequencies here. Well, actually, technically, VLF starts at 30 kilohertz and down. But we're dealing with low frequencies. And all sorts of things get conducted onto the power line, onto the coax cable, and out to the antenna. So remoting it helps, but you need to stop that noise from propagating. And the way you do that is with a common mode choke. Right now, I have two common mode chokes, and they're both bypassed. There's one leaving the uh, house here, and there's another one at the base of the antenna. Both of them are, are bypassed, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go and insert that choke, the one that I showed you before over there on the Group W bench, and you'll see how much of a difference this makes. So give me a second to walk over there. Oh, and remember uh, to take a look at 60 kilohertz here. You can see it popping up every once in a while. But let me go put that choke in, in uh, series and, and you'll see big difference. Okay, so now the common mode choke in the house here is in series and... As you can see, noise level dropped significantly. I'm going to take it back out again, and let's look at the signal level of this 33 kilohertz carrier that we're looking at. Let's make some notes. All right. Well, it looks like minus 62 dBm here. And that's not that far down from uh, S9 at minus 73. Actually, it's, uh, let me switch to uh, S meter. It's 10 over S9. So I'm going to pull the choke out again. And we'll take a look at it. And the, and the idea here is I'm going to show you what difference this choke makes in blocking some of the noise from being able to propagate out to the antenna. And then I'm going to put another choke in out at the antenna. Actually, you know what? Let's mute, uh, let's mute this because that's a real pain. Okay, so here goes. I'm going to pop that out again. So note that this is an S9 right now plus 10, 12 dB over. Let's look at this one too and see if this, if this carrier drops off. Here goes. All right, so we went from S9 plus 10 over down to an S8. Um, some of this stuff down here around 10 or 12 kilohertz I'm not going to be able to get rid of. But uh, let's, let's take a listen at something that's real now. And then we'll, uh, we'll go outside and put those chokes in. So, here we go. That's Cutler Main on 22 kilohertz. Let me get it all the way up to 22 kilo, or excuse me, 24 kilohertz. And I'm doing this at about 4 in the afternoon. This signal does vary significantly. There's another one here at 25 kilohertz, 25.2 rather. And uh, I'll show you where you can find all the information on these. But for now, I'm going to pause this audio and video here. Actually, I'm not sure how I'm going to do this. It's the first time using this Cam Studio software. So I guess I'll just make a, another recording. So. Here goes. I'm going to pause this, and uh, when you guys, when we both come back, 
you'll see the difference that the other choke makes, the one that I'm going to put out at the antenna itself. I'll be back. Okay, we're back. It's getting cold out there. It's about uh, 26 degrees right now in uh, northwest Connecticut. So you can see that the signal went from an S8 at 33 kilohertz to eh, four and a half S5, something like that. So dramatic, dramatic difference. So both filters, excuse me, both common mode chokes need to be in place to uh, eliminate as much as possible. Um, the rest of the noise um, is either actually ra uh, strong enough to be radiated and be picked up by the antenna, but I'm fairly confident that most anything that's leaving here on the coax cable with the choke on either end is pretty much eliminated. So let's pop on over to uh, 60 kilohertz here real quick. Turn the volume up a little bit. So that's WWVB in Boulder, which was just completely undetectable before. None, none of these things that I'm talking about here are any fault of the receiver. It's just one of the uh, battles you have to fight if you're interested in listening well below the, the broadcast band. Let's go back over to uh, 24 kilohertz. And I'm going to spread it out a little bit so we get a better look at it. There's uh, 24 kilohertz in Maine. That's um, NAA. You can look that up. It's in Cutler. Um, one of these two here. Let me narrow up the bandwidth a little bit. This one, I think, is in... Uh, this one's 24.8, excuse me, 25.2. I'll bring that up so you can see that. And then this one is in uh, 24.8 kilohertz. Uh, I'm gonna pause here for again for a second and move the uh, frequencies around so we can take a look at a couple others. I'll be back. Okay, we're back. Uh, right now we're centered at uh, 40.7 kilohertz, something like that. Uh, I'm going to bring that back down to the bottom screen. And I'm going to pop open um, a great resource here uh, for finding out where some of these stations are. So let's, uh, let's scroll down. I'll let you, SID monitoring, uh, sudden ionospheric disturbances. A lot of people will use uh, VLF stations for monitoring uh, ionospheric disturbances but let's get down here to uh, 24 kilohertz 24 kilohertz Cutler Maine the other one the small one in the middle there was uh, Jim Creek Washington and then the other one is at 25.2 um, in Lemoore Dakota North Dakota and I think 40.8 yeah the 40.8 is the NAU station that we're listening to right now in well, however you say that, Puerto Rico. Let's move along a little bit here. Oh yeah, let's take a look at uh, what happens when I pull out one of the uh, common mode filters, the one here in the shack. Okay, so you can see if anything really falls very close to any one of those uh, carriers, it becomes a real problem. Um, also, note this big mess right over here. Let's see what happens with that when I, when I pull this filter back out. Or excuse me, put the filter back in. So all that garbage is following the coax cable out to the antenna. So I'm going to pause here for a second 
And when I come back, I'm going to be up at uh, in the 300 kilohertz range, which is where the uh, differential GPS stations are. So I'll be back. Okay, so here we are in the, well, we're tuned to uh, 293 kilohertz right now. There's a, quite a few uh, differential GPS stations here. Uh, this particular one at 293 kilohertz. Let's, uh, let me pop open my log. Here's my log from last year of differential GPS stations. Uh, let's see, we'll start from the top, Ontario. Let's see, Newfoundland, uh, where the heck is it, what's MS? <laughs> I can't remember. Um, but you can see all these different differential GPS stations. Now, they're just there to augment the, the normal GPS and there's not much to listen to, but there are a few decoders that will uh, spit out the uh, longitude and latitude of where the transmitter is located and things like that. It's just another thing another type of utility station in the long wave bands that I was interested in. So um, I had the decoder and these are all the different stations that I logged. Let's drop that off. So we can pop over to a couple, a uh, couple more of these. Uh, okay. They're significant. There's quite a few of them. Some are not quite as strong as others, depending on where they are. And you can also see some beacons in here, some NDBs. Uh, let's go. Let's look. take a look at this one right here. like ZZR. Let's pop up the, um, let's see, let me recall, I haven't used this in a long time, ZZR. ZZR, Ontario at 317 kilohertz. So in the course of uh, one winter, using this system, using these common mode chokes, using this remote antenna system uh, with the three foot whip, I was able to log over 300 uh, non-directional beacons, several from uh, South America. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, takes a little bit of work to get a station running that's uh, quiet, um, but it's very satisfying. So um, I'm gonna finish off here with the actual visual presentations. Now I have to go back and do the stuff uh, showing you the filter and, and some of the specifications on that. Excuse me, I keep saying filter, but I mean the common mode choke. Some of the specifications on that and how it's made and maybe one of you guys uh, out there wants to do the same thing. So W1VLF signing off from the ham shack. Hey everybody, thanks for sticking with me and watching this video. Covered a lot of topics here uh, between the common mode chokes, the active antennas, and and uh, some of the differential GPS and things that you can hear in the long wave bands. Uh, spent a lot of time there over the years uh, experimenting. Uh, one other quick comment I wanted to mention was that the, uh, the cores, the ferrite cores that I used, or not actually the ones that I use, but if I was to make new common mode chokes for the long wave bands, I think I would would concentrate on one of two materials, either number 77 or J materials, which will give an awful lot of inductance per turn. Um, my third choice would be number 75. Thanks a lot again for watching, and please subscribe. I'm trying to get to a thousand subscribers. It's going to take a while, but uh, everyone helps. Thanks again, and this is W1VLF signing off, 73.